So really the goal here is to talk about uh, how things have evolved over the course of the past 10 or 15 years in, the, in our treatment of craniocervical dissociation. Part of the issue with, I think, the message that I'm trying to deliver is uh, one of heightened awareness about these injuries in a population that really sees them so rarely that it's difficult to have a heightened awareness of them. I'll start with a little bit of history. So as uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, craniocervical dissociations were once considered essentially unsurvivable and you'd read that they were uh, universally fatal. Uh, oftentimes, even 10 years ago in our own emergency department, even a patient that appeared to be uh, appeared to have a survivable injury, essentially uh, resuscitation would be discontinued because of the fact that they had what was essentially declared an unsurvivable injury once an AOD was diagnosed. And survivors at that time were considered reportable cases and over the course of the, you know, there's a few in the 60s and 70s, but over the course of the 80s and 90s and the earlier part of the century, there were an increasing number of, uh, of case reports of patients who had survived these injuries which suggested that we were starting to see survivors in greater numbers. As that occurred, it also became quite clear that we uh, had a pretty high rate of missed injuries in the order of 50 to 75 percent, and uh, that these patients who had missed injuries had a high likelihood of neurological deterioration, which obviously represented a, an area of concern as we started seeing more of these patients. And why, why were we seeing this compared to other injuries? Well, lack of a clinical suspicion for reasons that I just I think highlighted and the fact that we don't see very many of these, it's hard to stay uh, motivated to look for them. Um, what we've seen now is a trend towards increase, an increasing number of survivors, particularly obviously in major trauma centers, and it's probably due to improved pre-hospital care as compared to this uh, transport system that you see from the 1920s or so, and improved radiographic screening techniques that I mentioned, and also a more greater awareness and more proactive treatment. Uh, that being said, of course, the vast majority of these patients uh, who sustain these injuries do not survive. Uh, there was a, a paper recently published at our institution uh, which identified over the course of a five to six year period about 69, or 69 patients with craniocervical dissociation. 47 of them were identified post-mortem. This is by looking at not only the trauma re registry information but also the King County Medical Examiner, which is right next door here, their, uh, their records as well. So 47 were diagnosed post-mortem, 22 were diagnosed in the hospital, of which all but seven were essentially patients who barely made it through the door alive and were in extremis and, and expired really to the point where we can't really call them survivors, um, uh, even, uh, even in the short term. The characteristics of survivors, as you would expect, is they actually presented with higher GCS um, as well as th they were more likely to be normal tensive and they tended to have less displacement. 80% of the patients with, uh, who survived had Harris line displacement, as you see here on the bottom right, the Harris lines here, had Harris line displacement here of less than 16 millimeters. And of course, they were less likely to have neurological deficits. Uh, this gentleman, actually for a while at least, uh, he uh, defied those odds in that this patient survived for several months to the point where these, these issues can actually become uh, difficult ethical issues. When you look at someone who has this type of injury, you see the complete disruption here, and, uh, and is able to communicate and tell you he wants everything done, when you know that essentially anything we do will only lead to survival in a relatively short term, and he uh, eventually succumbed. He did en end up having a stabilization procedure, but eventually succumbed, I believe, somewhere between three and six months afterwards, as would be expected with this, with this type of devastating injury. With the appreciation that we are seeing more and more patients who were surviving because of the fact that they had minimal displacement, uh, but they, yet they still had highly unstable injuries, we uh, established, this was first published by Jens, we established the Harborview classification for these injuries, which uh, essentially stage one injuries were patients who had an MRI finding of a disruption, they had, first of all, minimally displaced occipital cervical or C12 complex, uh, as well as uh, um, minimal findings on their MRI scan, but some subluxation that suggested a potential problem. Stage two were patients who had actually very similar findings with regard to displacement and disruption of tissues, let's say, uh, at least on initial studies, as the stage ones, but a traction test, and I want to emphasize this is not a traction test here. This is a patient who was erroneously put in traction who had the type of injury I'm describing where they have minimal displacement, but where a, a controlled traction test will identify that they have a highly unstable injury and one that needs uh, fixation as opposed to the stage one, which is one that looks similar to this initially, uh, 
but actually does not distract on traction testing if we choose to do so to, uh, to further evaluate it. And then the stage threes are the ones that I think most people are familiar with, the ones that there's really no question what the diagnosis is. So this is a good example of a patient who comes in with a relatively uh, minimally displaced injury and they had a, some worrisome findings on MRI and you see here this is under controlled uh, live fluoroscopy in the operating room, manual traction, you can see that they're distracting quite readily and of course then you stop the distraction. You don't need really much more proof than that. And these patients can then be simply turned prone and undergo the occipital cervical stabilization once the proof is obtained. So we, we uh, first published our series, and this is a first published in 2006, even though the series was collected between 1996 and 2002. And we found a lot of the same findings that have been identified before, but of course this series was much larger than any previously published series. But the delay in diagnosis was quite large, 76% of patients, not just the ones who presented here, but the ones who initially presented elsewhere and then were transferred here. And there, were, uh, there was a significant likelihood of neurological worsening in patients who had a delay in diagnosis. In fact, 40% of patients with delay in diagnosis um, had uh, worsening of neurological status was often catastrophic. A patient who went from being more or less neurologically intact to a uh, complete high cervical quad really uh, instantly, whether being transferred to the MRI scanner or, or transferred for whatever other reason or one patient position prone to, to, uh, to deal with an occipital laceration, for instance. And one other thing we noticed is that these patients, even the patients who had either developed through uh, the delay in diagnosis who originally presented with severe neurological injuries, many of them actually did quite well and improved quite dramatically. In fact, 83% of patients who had incomplete spinal cord injuries, which was basically every patient except for two, there were two complete injuries, the other 15 were incomplete. So of those 15 patients, 83% uh, actually improved by at least one Asia grade and often more. Uh, and otherwise, other than the delay in diagnosis with associated loss of neurological function in, in many of those patients, there were really relatively few complications. I show one here where a patient actually had a malreduction intraoperatively. You can see that this is how they presented. And then over here you see this is the, after the first operation, you clearly have a dislocation of the occipital cervical joint. And then at least the reduction was improved here. And the patient actually got worse neurologically in the interim, but recovered nicely after he was taken back and, uh, and uh, realigned. So what, what this all tells us, however, is that although the fixation of these injuries uh, and the, the tr general treatment of these injuries in cha is challenging, really uh, the part that matters is making the diagnosis. Once you make the diagnosis and actually stabilize them, well, that becomes neuroprotective. And this is just to emphasize that as far as you know, placement of screws, screw accuracies, complications associated with that, there are several studies coming out now that demonstrate that C1 uh, screw accuracy is quite high and complication rates are quite low. There's a study out of China with, I think, 600 screws or so. The 95% accuracy, actually, no vertebral artery injuries. You see a few smaller studies. This one, the top one just came out. Uh, we have our own study from our own experience here where we had 96% of, uh, of screws that were placed in what we consider a, a safe manner, which is uh, type 1 and type 2 completely in and just maybe slightly skiving medially and we only had 4% that were unacceptable. And these would be examples of unacceptable screws with, again, no vertebral artery injuries, no neurological injuries. Uh, similarly, C2 instrumentation, we've looked at our own experience here, 98% accuracy rate in 736 screws, really one vertebral artery injury and one possible because the patient already had a dissection and it's hard to know what, what, uh, how surgery influenced. But in any case, a, a very low complication rate, which again brings us back Oh, and, and I, one thing I wanted to comment on, too, is that one of the reasons that we suspect that the uh, complication rate and accuracy rates with our C2 screws seems to be improved relative to some of the historical values is that now we have more options. We have the translaminar screws, we have the C1, C2 pedicle screw and lateral mass uh, options. You, you don't feel like you're driven to try to put in screws that, that aren't suited to the patient's anatomy for whatever reason or that for... Uh, any specific reason you're, you're not comfortable with. And I think the, the versatility that that's allowed us has made the fixation in this area um, much safer. And here's an example of a patient, for instance, who had a high-riding uh, C2 vertebral foramen on the right. So they had sort of this hybrid construct where on one side they had a transarticular screw, as you see here. On the other, they had a short par screw tickling the foramen there as well as a C1 lateral mass screw. And I think now, this was quite a while ago, I think now I'd probably put a translaminar screw here instead. Um, so just to emphasize the fact that we have options.
So kind of moving towards the original point is where we evolved from there now and how has it influenced the outcome of our patients. Well, we recently looked at uh, our whole series now, and this is dating back from 1996 again, so including the original 17 patients to 2002 and then 31 more patients from 2003 and beyond. So th these 48 patients, we wanted to look at has the timing to diagnosis changed in the latter group relative to the former group, the earlier group? And we wanted to also equate whether that's had an effect on a patient's neurological outcomes ultimately. Again, the comparison of the, of the two time frames. And so again, we had 48 patients total, 31 and 17 were compared. And the treatment methods were essentially unchanged over the course of the two periods. We generally uh, try to stabilize the patient as best we can once we have the diagnosis, whether that includes taping with sandbags, placement of reverse Trendelenburg to eliminate distraction, um, plus minus halo. I think we have differing opinions on the, on the uh, usefulness of halos, and I think it depends on the specific situation, how much displacement they have as well. And then we uh, do a posterior instrumented arthrodesis as soon as we can. One interesting finding, which is a little bit off of the, uh, the general goal of the study, is what we found I think it's important finding that we, we tend to think that the Harris lines are the most accurate assessment of, uh, of whether there's a craniocervical distractive injury. In this study, we found that 35% of patients had normal Harris lines, both Harris lines, the, BD, the BAI and the BDI were both uh, normal. As far as excluding occipital cervical injuries, it suggests that the Harris lines are becoming somewhat historical in their significance. I mean, they're, they're really designed because of the fact that X-rays, because of the parallax, the, the presence of the mastoid air cells, et cetera, don't really show you the occipital cervical complex very well. And because of that, you have to use these various lines to essentially presume the alignment of the joints. Well, now we have CT scans. We can see exactly what, how congruous or incongruous the joints are. And so the use of Harris lines probably isn't quite as useful anymore. And again, it certainly doesn't exclude injuries as this shows. As far as our, our uh, results on delayed diagnosis, in the initial series, we found that we had a very high likelihood of, of uh, delay in diagnosis. This time, I think it was 76% delay in diagnosis, so 24% were identified within a day, let's say, within 24 hours. Whereas in the latter series, we actually found that 84% of patients were diagnosed in a uh, timely manner. So there's obviously been a significant change there. Um, the average time to diagnosis, you can see, de decreased from 1.8 days to 0.35 days, and that was statistically significant. As far as neurological deterioration, the previous study, there were five patients that worsened out of 17. All five of those patients worsened uh, after delaying diagnosis. So five out of the 13 patients, or almost 40% of patients, had uh, worsening who had a delay in diagnosis. Currently, only one patient had a worsening of the neurological de uh, deficits, and uh, they also had a delay in diagnosis. Obviously, overall, it ends up being a much smaller percentage of the overall series, or even of the patients who had a delay in diagnosis. As far as our neurological outcome, we look at it in terms of patients who ended up, or who started and ended with useful motor function. We define that as Asia D or Asia E uh, Frankel grade. In the previous study, there were 41% of patients who had useful motor, motor function pre-op, and then 76%, I should say, at follow-up, not just post-op. Whereas currently, it was 26% of 55, which was an interesting finding to us. And I think I want to emphasize, first of all, that this 26% of patients. It's a significantly lower number of patients who are coming to us now with useful neurological function. Why is that? Well, my suspicion is that just because of improved pre-hospital care, patients who were previously not surviving furthermore, now initially patients hardly ever survived, then they started surviving. Now it seems that patients who, who, really, uh, who are really more and more in extremists are still surviving and coming to us. And uh, so it's not particularly surprising for that reason that the uh, the uh, number at follow-up would be lower as well, and we're starting with uh, a lower number at pre-op. Also, uh, there's a significant discrepancy at this point between the follow-up in the two groups, in that the first group being obviously much further uh, back in time has a much longer follow-up. And so it's very difficult to, to compare the uh, neurological outcomes at this point, but we'll continue to look at that. We still, based on the, the, the differences in uh, neurological worsening in these groups, associated with delay in diagnosis. Um, we still feel that prompt diagnosis is obviously important to optimize the outcome of these injuries. And uh, I already went over the common causes of, of delayed diagnosis. And just to reiterate here, 24% of patients were diagnosed in a timely manner before. 
uh, and 40% of those actually got worse neurologically. Now 84% were diagnosed in a timely manner, only a single patient got worse neurologically. Uh, we did have difficulty, as I mentioned, correlating diagnostic accuracy or diagnostic uh, timeliness, I should say, with longer-term improvement of neurological exam, and I listed, I already mentioned uh, the main reasons, I think, length of follow-up and difference in preoperative injury severity. Uh, so we have made significant improvements in, uh, in diagnosis, and I think this is a, a systems issue. It's not really, we're, we're often not the ones called initially. So this is an ER, radiology, uh, trauma surgery, and as, as well as spine surgery uh, issue. So I think from a system span standpoint, we've made tremendous improvements. Um, this likely lead to decreased uh, likelihood of, of neurological worsening, and probably, we think, improve the, uh, the neurological outcome in the future remaining to be determined, of course, in the long term. And that is the one area where we as physicians, we can't control the pre-hospital um, the pre-hospital course of these patients. So really the main area, it looks like, that where we can control uh, the outcome of our patients is to make these diagnoses appropriately, and it looks like we're heading in that direction. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next on a slightly less dramatic, but nevertheless equally troublesome basis, um, Rick Brantz is going to talk about lumbopelvic fixation and trauma, and I can uh, happily tell you that uh, all of these screw applications that you see here are FDA approved. <laughs> Finally. Okay, well, this is uh, just to talk a little bit about lumbopelvic reconstruction for traumatic sacral fractures, and we're going to talk about the main trauma ones, not really sacral insufficiency fractures or fractures below long constructs or something like that. And this is briefly the outline I want to try and cover in our briefly allotted time, looking at classification, looking at uh, traumatic sacral U fractures, and then kind of updating with some recent data that we've collected, and then briefly looking at unilateral unstable sacral fractures and applications for lumbopelvic fixation for those. So if we look at classification, just to get us all on the same page, you know, this is the classification that most people are familiar with from Denis looking at the zone one to zone three with progressive neurological deficits, and, and those play a role probably more significantly in the unilateral than in the bilateral, which tend to mostly be in the zone two, kind of cutting across. If we look at a subclassification of transverse sacral fractures, this was initially described by Roy Camille. You can see the type one to four um, as you kind of move from left to right. And then kind of the colloquial description that we tend to use for most of these that are indicative that uh, merit a lumbopelvic fixation, where you have the sacral U, sacral U on the upper right, the sacral H-type fracture, the lambda and the T-type. So if we now look at our traumatic uh, sacral U fractures, um, as Carlo talked about earlier, we talked about uh, atlanto-occipital dissociations. This is kind of the reverse uh, end, where instead of dislocating the head from the neck, we're dislocating the pelvis and the lower extremities from the spine. Highly unstable injuries and um, uh, merit some type of fixation. If we look historically at what's been used, uh, there is description of plate fixation. This used to be um, used mainly for horizontal fractures below S2, as you can see here in this upper right-hand uh, radiographs and, uh, and clinical, evalu clinical exam. Secondly, SI screw application. Uh, this still has a role in sacral U-type fractures and ones that don't have significant comminution or displacement, but really have to kind of use these uh, judiciously and generally for stable without neurological um, compression. The lumbopelvic fixation are those for um, the highly unstable ones and those in which you have significant uh, neurological compression. This technique has been well described, initially described back in uh, 1988 by uh, Thomas Schildhauer and his crew. Um, and you can see the technique is demonstrated here with the midline incision, uh, segmental fixation, uh, sometimes to L4, sometimes to L5 or both, um, and then down to the iliac wing. And this has been shown to be very stable, not requiring a brace with weight bearing as tolerated. If we look, here's the article that came out in 1988, and you can see it, this is allowing early weight bearing. So this is a very uh, solid construct, um, biomechanically very sound. This was then tested in the, in the cadaveric lab, uh, looking at um, time to failure. And uh, again, this was under cyclical load, they found that uh, if we look at these diagrams here, and if you look um, the top line there, you can see the, the, the iliosacral screws and the amount of motion with those versus the bottom line with the triangular fixation, so much more stable than uh, um, uh, SI screws alone. So if we look at kind of an application for this, here's a patient that came in, uh, sacral U-type injury, treated very well with uh, um, SI screws. However, that, that didn't hold up. Here we have post-operative day four. Notice this patient is non-weight-bearing, so just doing bed-to-chair mobility. And you can see that from the top picture to the bottom picture, we can already start to see that the, the screws are starting to fail, and we're starting to get some subsidence of the sacrum with it to within the pelvis. We can also see, if we look at our initial kyphosis on these films, that this patient is also starting to develop progressive kyphosis as they start to fail, and we can see loss of the fixation of the SI screws. <clears throat> 
So this patient is taken back to the operating room. The screws are removed. Um, this lumbopelvic fixation, as seen here on the bottom right, is placed. Um, and we can see a progression of the of, or re restoration of the appropriate uh, um, sacral alignment with the initial kyphosis uh, demonstrated here on the right. And then this was the failure. And then this is finally what we end up with. This was uh, well described in a, f a few previous articles. This came out. Um, uh, uh, a series of patients from 1997 to 2002 followed up here. And initially, these, um, these findings look pretty good. The kyphosis is better, going from 41 to 24 percent. There are no non-unions. There's no loss of reductions. There's no neuro neurological deterioration. So that all looks pretty good. If we also look at bowel and bladder control and recovery, we see that neurologically, 83 percent of these patients improved. Not all of them did, but um, most made some, some element of improvement. However, if we then look on the complication side, if you look here at the bottom, we see that 44% of the patients required a second operation. So that's not good. These things range from seromas to infections to broken rods. And again, the broken rods may not be completely unexpected as you're, you're sticking screws across a joint and you're not really fusing the SI joints. So we recently went back and looked uh, through our more recent data. Since 2002, we've had several more patients come through Harborview. Um, although this is still a rare injury. We've changed our technique a little bit to try and recess the screws a little bit lower, so hopefully avoiding lower uh, or, or avoiding hardware prominence and trying to adjust our contour and timing to better manage these patients. Our hypothesis going into this, and this is a bit of a long slide, but while, while our institutional and surgeon experience may have improved as we've kind of gained um, exposure to more of these things, these injuries are by their very nature have a guarded neurological prognosis and a high rate of complication just due to the trauma causing these things. So what we weren't quite sure is how much of it we can improve on and how much of it is just due to the nature of the injury that they come in with. When we looked back through our records, we found that we treat 240 sacral fractures per year here. If you look at the various treatment modalities used, you can still see that most of these are non-operative with over 50%. And really, lumbopelvic fixation only accounts for 3.8 per year, or 1.6 of all sacral fractures that come through here. If we look at this diagrammatically, we can see the lumbopelvic is here in the orange, and again, only rep represent 1.6, with the bulk of them being fixed with other modalities. And this is all sacral fractures. This is not sacral U fractures. We looked specifically for sacral U fractures. We found 22 consecutive patients that were identified um, in our time frame. Three of these patients were failure of SI screw fixation and qualified. Uh, eight of the 22 had uh, unilateral injury and kind of fell into a different category that we'll talk about at the end. We had an average follow-up of 26.3 uh, months. If we look at our demographics, uh, this was our age distribution, 37 years, half male, half female. And these um, mechanisms of injury tend to be very high. Motor vehicle accidents fall from heights, uh, one equestrian accident. The other thing that's interesting to note is just how the nature of the trauma. These are highly uh, traumatized patients. 96 had extra injuries, extremity fractures, abdominal injuries, uh, thoracic injuries, facial trauma, to name a few. So again, it, it makes evaluating the results difficult as a lot of these things overlap, as we'll see um, in the next slide. So if we look at the Gibbons classification of cauda equine improvement, which is really what we use in assessing these, these patients are going to have a, a sacral type injury. So most of these patients have, or many of them will have bowel and bladder issues. But if you look at the, the Gibbons classification, if you have bowel and bladder dysfunction, it gives you a score of four. So even if your other things, uh, other um, areas improve, such as lower extremity motor deficits, you still have a hard time getting off that lower uh, uh, tier of four. If we look at our Gibbons score, we improved from 2.9 to 2.2. Um, eight patients with a pre-op Gibbons score of four, 75% showed improvement, and only one patient had persistent bowel symptoms. This patient also had a uh, concomitant rectal injury requiring a partial colectomy, which kind of clouds the data there. If we look at our overall uh, kyphosis correction, we corrected from 34 to 25 uh, degrees, so nine degrees of overall correction. Again, no failure fixation. Eight patients required operative IND of infected wounds. And this is not an uncommon picture, as you can see up here, just the amount of bruising and all associated with the soft tissue stripping and these highly traumatic injuries. Five patients, or 23%, had uh, symptomatic hardware removal or revised. So if we look at our, our current data, which is on the right, uh, compared to our historical data, we really haven't changed much. And again, these are small numbers, but our, our Gibbons score has, has, if anything, gotten worse. Our kyphosis hasn't really corrected any better. We still have significant wound complications, and we still have significant hardware-related complications. So if we kind of look at this together, neurologically, we're not really doing any better. Radiographically, we're not really doing any better. Complications-wise, we're not really doing any better. But really, I, I think our summary was, when we kind of looked at our overall group of patients, these injuries are devastating, and probably our techniques are about as good as they can get. Um, and I think a lot of the, the badness that comes out of these is due to the patient's injury initially, and not so much with what we do to them or our, our, fi our fixation techniques. <coughs> 
Just a brief talk on uh, unilateral unstable sacral fractures. These are kind of indications for uh, lumbopelvic fixation. These are uh, fractures where the sacral fracture has a vertical uh, instability and there's migration or if there's unilateral comminution. So here's a patient that came in and if you look at this kind of upper film up here, you can see the amount of comminution here in zone two. And you can imagine if you treat this with an SI screw, you're just gonna crush all this and crush the nerve roots coming through here. So this is a good patient where um, you get a combination of lumbopelvic to kind of stabilize this and back it up with an iliosacral screw. This is the patient that came in. Uh, he fell off a horse. Uh, you can see already that he's got this vertical migration of his right hemipelvis with respect to his spine and his left side. He was initially taken to the operating room, uh, very successfully treated with these retrograde pubic screws and these um, SI screws. Here he is on his uh, inlet view, here he is on the outlet view, and all looks pretty good. He comes back three weeks later, he now has an L5 radiculopathy. You can see his initial uh, AP film here, and now kind of the, the loss of fixation, the migration. Here he is on the outlet view, you can see the change there. And here he is on the inlet view, and again you can see the loss of fixation and just the, uh, uh, the migration of the hemipelvis. So this patient was taken back, uh, the, uh, the pubic screws were removed, the sacroiliac screws were removed. Uh, we did a Wiltsy approach here, took this down, this, there's no fusion here, so screws into four and five. Um, ili um, iliac screws here, we were able to reduce that hemipelvis, and you can see on the um, inlet view here, the restoration of the pelvic um, uh, um, anatomy. Here we are on the outlet view, and uh, pr looks pretty good on the uh, axial cut of the CT as well. So in conclusion, um, these lumbopelvic fixations, a powerful tool. Um, it's been shown biomechanically to have uh, excellent fixation. These patients can mobilize, they can weight bear as tolerated. Um, and so it can be a very uh, helpful tool in managing some of these injuries. Uh, the complications are high despite our evolution and techniques. And so I think it's important to discuss with these patients when managing them, what complications arise, and uh, that uh, some of the limitations in taking care of this. Thank you.